Hi everybody, thanks for joining me again as I go through Lee Strobel's The Case for Christ one chapter at a time, examining it from the atheist perspective. I'm about to do chapter 9, the profile evidence, Did Jesus Fulfill the Attributes of God? We begin with the Richard Speck story. You might have heard of Richard Speck, unlike some of the other people mentioned in the uh, opening chapter anecdotes of Strobel's book. Richard Speck was a mass murderer in the 1960s, and he uses the story of Richard Speck, who raped and murdered eight nurses in a Chicago hospital in 1966, only to be arrested thanks in part to a police sketch that was based on a description given by one of the surviving witnesses, the, the only surviving witness actually, to illustrate the importance of forensic artists. That's why Strobel tells us the story of Richard Speck. He also mentions the uh, electronic facial identification technique software and uh, how that can create composite sketches uh, using the aid of a computer by selecting from different types of features. It was uh, highlighted in a particularly good episode of MacGyver, I remember. Uh, and how a program like this was used to create a composite sketch that was instrumental in apprehending a suspect in a 1997 kidnapping that occurred near Strobel's own home in uh, Chicago. The composite drawing, says Strobel, can be used as an analogy to help understand the truth about Jesus. Only instead of an eyewitness, we gather our details about Jesus for our composite sketch from the New Testament. And Strobel suggests that we take that sketch of Jesus from the New Testament and we compare it to the attributes of God that are described in the Old Testament and see how Jesus matches up with that sketch. We compare the Jesus of the New Testament to the God of the Old Testament and see if there's a match and evaluate whether or not the claims by Jesus of his deity should be taken seriously. And just to get started, Strobel mentions a few apparent contradictions between Jesus and God as portrayed in the Old Testament. That God, for instance, is said to be omnipresent and omniscient, yet clearly Jesus is only ever in one place at a time. And in Mark chapter 13, verse 32, he says that he tells the disciples that he doesn't know what will happen in the future, which seems to limit his knowledge. He can't be omniscient if that's true. And Strobel wonders how we can reconcile these contradictions between Jesus and the Old Testament God. So once again, we notice that Strobel has just entirely abandoned his pretense of addressing non-believers with this book. He's clearly talking to believers because he is presuming the historical authenticity of the Old Testament. How do we know what God is like so we can compare the attributes of God to Jesus? Why, we look to the Old Testament, of course. Where else would we look? So we move on to the eighth interview in the book, Donald A. Carson, Ph.D., he is a research professor of New Testament at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School. He's the author of over 40 books, including The Sermon on the Mount, Exegetical Fallacies, and The Gagging of God. That last one sounds kinky. He reads a dozen languages. He's a member of the Tyndale Fellowship for Biblical Research, the Society for Biblical Literature, and the Institute for Biblical Research. He's an expert on the historical Jesus, on postmodernism, on Greek grammar, and on the theology of Paul and John. And Carson, according to Strobel, is not, quote, the starched academic that Strobel was expecting, but rather he's warm and sincere. Is Strobel's bigotry toward college professors starting to really bother anybody else? I mean, he never misses a chance at the beginning of these chapters when he's describing his experts to denigrate academia and scholars in general. He always repeatedly expresses this pleasant surprise that the educated people he's interviewing aren't aloof, stuffy, condescending pricks. And yet every single person he has interviewed so far for this book has been a PhD. He clearly knows that this starched academic thing is a stereotype, and yet he still defaults to it when describing his experts. And not only Strobel, because he's interviewed academics for this book up to this point, and he's been to college himself, anybody who's ever been to college, who's ever lived in a university setting, knows that there's enough diversity among the faculty, among the scholars that will be teaching you. 
to render Strobel's repeated sense of, 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 of shock and surprise that the, the academics he's interviewing aren't total stuffy, pointy-headed pricks, utterly nonsensical. He's just, what a repugnant asshole. Living and forgiving like God. Strobel asks Donald Carson why he thinks Jesus is God, and instead of citing anything supernatural, as Strobel had anticipated, Carson says the most striking thing that Jesus did to indicate he was God was to forgive sins. And Carson says, quote, The point is, if you do something against me, I have the right to forgive you. However, if you do something against me and somebody else comes along and says, I forgive you, what kind of cheek is that? The only person who can say that sort of thing meaningfully is God himself, because sin, even if it is against other people, is first and foremost a defiance of God and his laws. Now you can see what I mean about no longer even talking to non-believers. This concept of forgiveness would only make sense to a theist. The God of a deist even doesn't care what we do to each other and claims no right to forgive us for crimes that we commit against other people. And obviously an atheist doesn't think gods are involved in forgiveness at all. You have to be a theist and accept that your crimes against others are also crimes against God in order for this concept of forgiveness to make any sense at all. Now, with some helpful prompting from Strobel, again demonstrating his Woodward and Bernstein-like journalistic tenacity, Carson also cites the sinlessness of Jesus as evidence of, of deity. And he says that historically in the West, the most holy people have been those who were aware of their own sins and shortcomings but sought God's help to rise above them, but that's not the case with Jesus. Carson says, quote, But along comes Jesus, who can say with a straight face, Which of you can convict me of a sin? If I said that, my wife and children and all who know me would be glad to stand up and testify, whereas no one could with respect to Christ. Which we know is true because it's in the book written by the people who worshipped him. Now let's examine this idea of the sinlessness of Christ a bit closer. Is it really true assuming for the moment that the Gospels are true and factual, that no one could have convicted Jesus of a sin? Was he really, really ethically perfect? What about the story of the fig tree that we discussed in the review of the last chapter? Jesus gets angry that this fig tree is not bearing figs, even though it's not fig season yet, and he kills the tree. He curses it so that it will never again bear fruit. And when they walk by it the next day, the tree is withered, and dead. And even if, as some people argue, this act is meant to be symbolic, the tree is still dead. Is it really cool to kill a tree just to prove a point? It's not even Jesus' tree. Or what about my personal favorite uh, from Luke chapter 8 verses 27 to 33? Quote, and when he went forth to land, there met him out of the city a certain man who had devils long time and wear no clothes, neither abode in any house but in the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell down before him, and with a loud voice said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of God most high? I beseech thee, torment me not, for he had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. For oftentimes it had caught him, and he was kept bound with chains and in fetters, and he brake the bands, and was driven of the devil into the wilderness. And Jesus asked him, saying, What is thy name? And he said, Legion, because many devils were entered into him. And they besought him that he would not command them to go out into the deep. And there was there an herd of many swine feeding on the mountain. And they besought him that he would suffer them to enter into them. And he suffered them. Then went the devils out of the man and entered into the swine. And the herd ran violently down a steep place into the lake and were choked. Jesus casts these many demons out of this man and allows the demons to go into a herd of pigs. And the pigs then run into a lake and drown. So Jesus kills an entire herd of animals that didn't belong to him. He devastates the livelihood of whichever farmer happened to own those pigs when he could have just cast the demons out without letting them jump into the pigs. We, we don't see demons being cast out of people and having to jump into animals or other people any other time. You think Jesus can't be convicted of any sin? Ask the guy who owned the pigs. Mystery of the Incarnation.
Strobel challenges Carson to reconcile the omniscience and omnipresence of God with the fact that Jesus clearly has limited knowledge and abilities. Strobel says, quote, pointing my pen at him for emphasis, I concluded by saying, let's admit it. The Bible itself seems to argue against Jesus being God. I love how pitifully transparent these supposedly tough questions by Strobel are. He reminds me of Dwight on The Office. Depression? Isn't that just a fancy word for feeling bummed out? That's what he sounds like. So Carson describes two attempts historically by theologians to deal with this problem. First, there is the explanation of the dual nature of Christ, that although Jesus was fully God and therefore omniscient and omnipotent, he was also fully human and therefore necessarily limited in those powers. And then there's also the notion of kenosis, and that is in choosing to be incarnated as Jesus, God voluntarily and temporarily relinquished certain aspects of his deity, like the omniscience and the omnipotence. Stropel decides that kenosis sounds like a good idea to him, and he disposes of the issue by saying that we really shouldn't expect our finite minds to be able to fully comprehend something like the Incarnation. It's sort of an argument from ignorance, argument from your own ignorance. Creator or created? Despite the Old Testament suggesting that God is an eternal and uncreated being, some verses in the New Testament seem to indicate clearly that Jesus was created at some point, meaning that he is not eternal. Strobel cites John 3.16, where it refers to Jesus as God's begotten Son, and also Colossians 1.15, uh, calling Jesus firstborn over all creation, as examples of this language referring to Jesus as being born. Carson explains away the reference to Jesus as the begotten Son of God by claiming that it doesn't refer to the begetting or the siring of Jesus. Instead, the Greek word that is translated as begotten in the King James Version actually would be better translated as unique. And in more recent translations, it is translated as his one and only son rather than his only begotten son. And then there's the firstborn reference in Colossians chapter 1, verse 15, which according to uh, Carson, describes Jesus' status as the rightful heir of God, not him being born in, in the literal sense. Firstborn, according to Carson at that time, was used as a term to describe the rightful heir of a family and wasn't necessarily being used to directly reference the birth of the person who was being described as firstborn. And Carson also quotes uh, from later in the same book, from Colossians uh, 2, 9, which refers to Christ possessing all the fullness of deity. And Carson says about that, quote, The author wouldn't contradict himself, so the term firstborn cannot exclude Jesus' eternality, since that is part of what it means to possess the fullness of the divine. Eternality, that's a good word. So why are we assuming that the author of Colossians traditionally thought to be Paul, wouldn't contradict himself. I mean, perhaps he would not contradict himself on purpose, but do people usually contradict themselves on purpose? Sure, we could interpret it as Carson does, as firstborn meaning rightful heir and not first one born, but if we aren't starting with the presumption that this is divinely revealed and perfect scripture, because there's not a single reason to do that, doesn't it make at least as much sense to suggest that the author's theology is incoherent? They also address the passage in the book of Mark where Jesus responds to being called the good master by saying, uh, quote, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. That's from Mark chapter 10, that's verses 17 and 18. According to Carson, Jesus is not denying his divinity or his goodness by questioning this form of address, good master, but he's merely forcing the other person to think about what he's saying when he calls Jesus good, with, by Jesus insisting that only God is good. He's telling the person, if you're saying that I am a good master, then you are admitting that I am God or I am on the same level as God, because only God is truly good. And are you sure that that is what you really mean to say? Was Jesus a lesser God? What do you think the answer to this question will be? Um, Strobel quotes John chapter 14, verse 28, when Jesus tells his disciples, quote, My father is greater than I. 
Carson suggests that we look at the verse in context, not just in isolation, to understand its meaning. And John 14 is the Let Not Your Heart Be Troubled chapter, a very familiar passage in Scripture. Carson says that Jesus is telling the disciples who are upset to learn that Jesus will be leaving them soon, that they shouldn't be upset because he's only leaving earth to return to heaven. Uh, and that when he's in heaven, he will be truly powerful because he will no longer be limited by the Incarnation. Kind of renders the whole sacrifice on the cross thing meaningless, doesn't it? I mean, and since we're talking in this chapter about the attributes of God, how about we take a minute to mention one that Strobel and Carson avoid talking about, and that is the insatiable bloodlust of God. Think about this now. Jesus dies on the cross for the sins of humanity because God refuses to just forgive sin without a blood sacrifice. But Jesus comes back to life after three days, so he doesn't really die. Not only that, but he comes back to life, he ascends to heaven, where he basically gets the job of running the entire universe. So nothing at all can be said to have really been sacrificed in any meaningful way. Which begs the question, why was the crucifixion necessary in the first place? God's compulsion to see blood spilled in his name is so undeniable that he'll indulge it even knowing that ultimately it's nothing more than a gruesome bit of theater for him. That, that's some sick, twisted shit. Next section, the disquieting notion of hell. By Jesus' own reckoning, most people end up burning in hell after they die, and the word Strobel chooses to describe this, which he believes to be a fact, is disquieting. I'm just saying. So if God is loving, what's with hell? That's basically the question of this section. And why does Jesus talk about hell more than anyone else in the Bible, if he is an incarnation of this loving God. And Carson tries to justify hell by first explaining sin. And Carson says, quote, Picture God in the beginning of creation with a man and a woman made in his image. They wake up in the morning and think about God. They delight to do what he wants. It's their whole pleasure. They're rightly related to him, and they're rightly related to each other. Then, with the entrance of sin and rebellion into the world, these image bearers begin to think that they are at the center of the universe. And that's the way we think. And then he goes on to say that things like war and rape are the result of people not being right with God, which is just background noise to me. I've heard that so much. God sure is a dick, huh? So, uncounted generations of people have gone to hell where they're going to be forever because they wanted more out of life than just doing whatever God wanted? The nerve. Carson says, quote, So what should God do about it? If he says, well, I don't give a rip, he's saying that evil doesn't matter to him. It's a bit like saying, oh yeah, the Holocaust. I don't care. Yes, good point. Except that it's nothing like that. You're comparing someone wanting the option of a life that doesn't entirely revolve around God to the systematic extermination of millions of innocent people. You know, it's a good thing you lack the self-awareness necessary to truly grasp what that analogy says about you, Dr. Carson, because otherwise you'd probably really hate yourself. So Carson clarifies that people aren't sent to hell just for believing in the wrong stuff, but for defying their maker. And again, showing his objectivity, Strobel capitalizes maker. Carson says, quote, Hell is not filled with people who have already repented, only God isn't gentle or good enough to let them out. It's filled with people who, for all eternity, still want to be at the center of the universe and who persist in their God-defying rebellion. Actually, one of the most fundamental and, for some, troubling realizations experienced by atheists is that they are not the center of the universe. And that, in fact, on the cosmic scale, they don't matter at all. You'd think that Lee Strobel would have pointed this out to Carson. After all, wasn't Lee Strobel an atheist? Strobel asks if eternal torment in hell might not be a tad excessive. And Carson suggests that the torments of hell are not the result of God, but of the sinners themselves, because they're the ones who are living apart from God. Strobel says, quote, I grabbed the hold of that last statement. In other words, I said, at the time of judgment, there is nobody in the world who will walk away from that experience saying that they have been treated unfairly by God. 
everyone will recognize the fundamental justice in the way God judges them and the world. That's right, Carson said firmly. It's nice when the lawyers fill out the testimony for the witnesses, isn't it? Jesus and slavery. Strobel wonders if Jesus' um, apparent tolerance of slavery means that he isn't ethically perfect and therefore ineligible to be God. Strobel asks Carson if Jesus was morally deficient for failing to call for the abolition of slavery despite living in a society where he would have been surrounded by slaves all his life. And that takes us straight into the next section called Overthrowing Oppression, which begins with Carson describing how slavery in the culture of Jesus was very different than slavery was here in the United States, which ended in the 19th century. Back in Jesus' day, it was used as a means of repaying debt. It was an integral part of the economic system. Some slaves were teachers rather than laborers, and it wasn't associated with any particular race. People from all walks of life and all races and all nationalities could have been slaves based on certain circumstances. And also, in Jewish society, slaves were supposed to be freed on the Jubilee every seven years. And Carson says, quote, but you have to keep your eye on Jesus's mission. Essentially, he did not come to overturn the Roman economic system, which included slavery. He came to free men and women from their sins. And here's my point. What his message does is transform people so they begin to love God with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love their neighbor as themselves. Naturally, that has an impact on the idea of slavery. Carson argues that Jesus and others who carried on his message, like the Apostle Paul, encouraged new ways of thinking and interacting that ultimately resulted in the overthrow of slavery, even if they didn't explicitly condemn it. And Carson cites Thomas Sowell, who he takes care to describe as an African-American scholar, to explain how slavery in the West eventually ended. And Carson says, quote, Sowell points out that the driving impetus for the abolition of slavery was the evangelical awakening in England. Christians rammed abolition through Parliament in the beginning of the 19th century, and then eventually used British gunboats to stop the slave trade across the Atlantic. That the abolition of slavery in the West was the result of Christian righteousness is an article of faith for many people, but that doesn't mean that it's necessarily a matter of fact. Certainly, Christians like Bailby Porteous and William Wilberforce were very important in abolishing slavery in the British Empire, but maybe this is just my bias showing. I can't help but notice that these calls for abolition never really gained any momentum until after the start of the Enlightenment. And the Enlightenment was not a religious movement. It was an intellectual movement that emphasized reason and science. Europe had been populated and ruled by Christians for centuries, and there was barely a whisper about abolishing slavery. And then within a few decades of the end of the Enlightenment, it was gone. So you tell me who deserves credit. And by the way, the first published article calling for abolition of slavery in what would soon become the United States was written in 1775 by Thomas Paine, who was emphatically not a Christian. Strobel describes a friend of his who went from being an open and unapologetic racist to someone who is, quote, genuinely caring and accepting toward others, including those who are different from him, after converting to Christianity. And Strobel says, quote, legislation didn't change him, reasoning didn't change him, emotional appeals didn't change him. He'll tell you that God changed him from the inside out, decisively, completely, permanently. That's one of many examples I've seen of the power of the gospel to transform vengeful haters into humanitarians, hard-hearted hoarders into soft-hearted givers, power mongers into selfless servants, and people who exploit others into people who embrace all. First of all, Lee, civil rights legislation isn't passed for the benefit of people like your friend used to be. It's passed to protect the people who would be abused by people like that. Secondly, you were a legal reporter. You must be aware of the difference between anecdotal and empirical evidence. Your friend became a Christian and now he's a better person. Good for him. I don't begrudge him that at all. And there are probably thousands, hell, millions of stories just like his, of people who found religion and became better people after the fact. But what about the people who use their faith as a justification for their bigotry? What about the people who cling to the Bible and their hatred and bigotry becomes calcified rather than disappearing? There are quite a few of those.
Or what about the people who reform their character after converting to Islam? Or to Buddhism? Do their stories speak the truth of their scriptures, just the same as your friends speaks the truth of the gospel? What about people who are moved to renounce bigotry when they leave religion altogether? What about those, like myself, who consider themselves better people since they embrace their atheism than they ever were when they were clinging to a religious faith? Are you as moved by our stories as you expect us to be moved by the story of your friend? Matching the sketch of God, Strobel ends this chapter by reiterating what a mind-boggling concept the Incarnation is, and then quoting from the New Testament to establish that Jesus possesses the omniscience, the omnipresence, omnipotence, eternality. See, that's a good word. Strobel stole that word from Carson. That's a good word. And immutability, even though if we accept the concept of kenosis, he may have temporarily imposed limitations on his ability to exercise those attributes. And Strobel says, quote, also, the Old Testament paints a portrait of God by using such titles and descriptions as Alpha and Omega, Lord, Savior, King, Judge, Light, Rock, Redeemer, Shepherd, Creator, Giver of Life, Forgiver of Sin, and Speaker with Divine Authority. It's fascinating to note that in the New Testament, each and every one is applied to Jesus. What a terrible abuse of the word fascinating. What is so goddamn fascinating? about those titles of God from the Old Testament being applied to Jesus. I know that the people who wrote the Gospels thought that Jesus was God and wanted other people to think that Jesus was God, but what does it prove? Fuck prove. What does it even suggest beyond the self-evident fact that, as Christopher Hitchens liked to point out, whenever people talked about Jesus as the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy, that the New Testament was written after the Old. Speaking of Old Testament prophecy, that's the subject of the next chapter. This is the end of this chapter, chapter 9. Next, we'll be doing chapter 10, the fingerprint evidence. Did Jesus and Jesus alone match the identity of the Messiah? Thanks, as always, for watching, for uh, commenting, for asking questions, and uh, amplifying my points in certain cases. A lot of you have left comments that have gotten to the point far better than things I've said in these videos, and I really appreciate that. I think that's awesome. And I appreciate also your attention, your indulgence, everything. Just the fact that you're here watching this. It means a lot to me. I'm very grateful for it. And I'll see you next time.